Uh, and then rather than their mind becoming diffused or, or confused, it actually becomes sharper. They encounter deceased loved ones, sometimes deceased animals too. Communication is through telepathy. They get a flood of knowledge about the life, the universe, and the future. Oftentimes they don't remember that, but nevertheless they have the sense that they got that somehow, a huge download about the world. And then return to the body often very reluctantly. I don't, I don't know of many cases of NDEs where people were able to feel the body or see the body and actually want to come back into it. Uh, the interesting thing about this is not only is it cross-cultural and throughout history, but the transformational after, aftermath of it is very profound. It's one of the few things that we know of that can take a personality and make a, a step change in it. Personality is pretty stable in most people from around age five all the way through, through adulthood. But a near-death experience does something that changes the person and, among other things, makes them much more psychically attuned. Has anyone here have, has had a, a near-death experience? One. Would you agree with that, with the transformational? Yes. So there are some experiments now being done to induce a near-death experience. Uh, these are done um, by Bruce Grayson at the University of Virginia, and then there was a, a larger splash done by Sam Parnia, which is a worldwide effort to take advantage of people that are having a cardiac arrest in the hospital, and the uh, operatories will have a target which can only be seen from above. So if the people report that they've had an out-of-body or near-death experience, they'll be able to check to see if they're, what they're seeing was veridically correct because there are targets that they would see if they were floating above the operatory that you can't see if you're below that. So, so far, I don't think there are any cases where someone has reported correctly. I floated out of my body and looking down, saw myself surrounded by seven grieving dwarfs and sundry sad-eyed woodland creatures. And Snow White says, I was immersed in a white light and feeling a joy I cannot describe. And a tingling sensation on my lips caused me to regain consciousness. There's Snow White and Sleeping Beauty having tea. So out of body and near-death experiences probably occur in many different ways. Um, I think, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over this case. I'll just describe it. This is a case uh, which is considered one of the best near-death experience cases because uh, the woman involved had a, an aneurysm in the brain that could not be um, treated or could not be surgically removed without put, cooling her body to 60 degrees and then draining all of the blood out of her head. So her brain was both electrically flatlined and there wasn't any blood in it left. So it's as dead meat as you can get. And she reported a classic NDE. So the question in this case is, how did she report vertical details about what was going on when there was literally no, no electrical and no chemical activity happening in the brain at all? And so there are both proponents and skeptics about this particular case, but it shows that at least under conditions where someone is dead meat, that there seems to be some awareness that continues. Uh, the counter example or the counter arguments is that the amount of time when she was really, really dead uh, was about five minutes. That's when they, they removed the blood from the brain, was able to go in and get the aneurysm, take it out, and so on. It only took around five minutes for that part, but the whole surgery lasted for hours. Now, she was under general anesthetics, and in that particular case, in order to, to check the activity of her brain, they not only put ear, ear pieces in her ear, but the, there were the clicks that were about 100 dB, extremely loud clicks in the ears, so they're able to check the activity of the brain stem. And so when the brain stem goes dead, they know that the brain was completely flushed. There's no blood. There's no activity at all. That's why they were doing that. And that's important because she, under those conditions, the likelihood that she was able to hear something, even unconsciously, is very, very low. She had ear blocks, ear sounds, and there wasn't any blood in her head anymore. So that's, that's a pretty good case. And this is a clip you can find on YouTube where she's talking about it. At a body experience... Lots of people talk about these things. Of course, there are places like the Monroe Institute that have specialized in ways of evoking uh, out-of-body experiences. Here's an actual unre unretouched photo of an out-of-body experience. <laughs> Reincarnation is another very interesting area. Ian Stevenson is probably best known for developing hundreds and hundreds of cases, mostly in India, but not exclusively, 
of examples suggestive, as he would say, suggestive of reincarnation, almost always in children around age three or four who report previous lives, that they were a husband or they were a wife and they were lived in this village and so on. Lots and lots of details that a child that old probably shouldn't have that are verifiable. So what Ian did, would he would get hear of a case like this, he would go out and he would interview everybody involved, both the child, their family, and the other people that the, that, uh, the child said that they were a part of the family, and a number of cases found pretty good evidence that the children had memories that they shouldn't have had, and it looked a lot like reincarnation. There are other cases that occur everywhere else in the world, but it's much more frequent in India because they believe in reincarnation more, so maybe it's simply talked about more often. Brian Weiss has specialized in past life regression. So if, if reincarnation is true, then in principle, we could all be regressed back into a time where we remember our past lives. As far as, I mean, this is a very popular thing to do. There are other people who do it as well. As far as I know, uh, it hasn't reached the same level of, uh, of evidence, of clear evidence, credible evidence, as the cases of reincarnation. And it's partially because it's very difficult to separate fantasy from reality here. So, I mean, if, if I think of who I might be reincarnated of, it's not going to be somebody who is driving a taxi somewhere. You know, it would be someone who is driving, maybe owning taxis. But... <laughs> and then more recently, we have these things. Uh, this is uh, Walter Semkew's idea that return of the revolutionaries, there's something like a soul genome that you, the soul continues over many lives and manifests in similar ways. So here he's making comparison between simply the way that people look and what their interests are with William James and, um, um, oh, and Jeff Mishlove. So it, his book, and he has other books now also, going through examples where there seem to be a lot of correspondences, more than you'd expect by chance. It's, it hasn't yet brought itself to a level where you can do empirical tests. And so that's where... Uh, Paul von Ward is, is now is taking this to a next stage where he's trying to come up with ways of looking at both physical similarities and lots and lots of other variabilities or variables to match people who have died who are, we know a lot about versus people who are still living, which we know a lot about as well. So I'm going to help him with the statistics on this to see if we can find a way of matching and cross-matching uh, with uh, people rather than simply just taking advantage of superficial similarities. So that's, it's an interesting concept. Let's see if this clip is working. This was on ABC News recently. Now we move on to our series on the paranormal. Three out of four Americans believe in some kind of paranormal activity. But what about reincarnation, being reborn in the body of another? Half of Americans believe, half do not. And if you're one of these skeptics, try to explain how a little boy could know specific details about a fighter pilot who lost his life more than 60 years ago. It's a story you have to see to believe. Okay, this is really tough. I need somebody to help me. All right, I'm the volunteer. What do you want me to do? Okay, I'm just going to climb this thing and you have to call me in case I fall. Done. This is James Leiniger at six, all boy and all spirit. This is a special plane that goes in reverse. You don't see a lot of that. James knows a lot about planes, especially war planes. What kind of airplane is that? It's a car, sir. His parents, Andrea and Bruce Leiniger, say from an early age, James would play with nothing else. He was obsessed with airplanes. If you look around the house, that's all you'll see. Airplanes, helicopters, aircraft carriers. But then, when he was two, the planes James loved suddenly began to give him frequent and frightening nightmares. I'd wake him up and he'd be screaming and he'd always be laying on his back, kicking his feet up at the ceiling. And I'd say, baby, what were you dreaming about? And he'd say, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. They sound like typical kiddie nightmares, but Andrea says they went on the same way for months. Maybe too much TV, but James was just two and his parents say only watching Barney and Teletubbies. Teletubbies! And Andrea and Bruce say they weren't watching World War II documentaries or conversing about military history. This is an F-18? No, that one. So what explains the nightmares and James's strange obsession with airplanes? I talked to my mom about it. 
a lot of times. And my mom had said maybe he's remembering a past life. What did you say? Politely, baloney. But as time went by, Andrea didn't know what to believe. Here is James at age three, going over a plane as if he's doing a pre-flight check. He would continue to say and do things that were puzzling, like the time his mom bought him a toy airplane. And I said, oh, look, there's a bomb on the bottom of it. He said, that's not a bomb, Mama, that's a drop tank. A drop tank? I did, I'd never heard of a drop tank. I didn't know what a drop tank was. His parents say between the ages of two and four, James would reveal extraordinary details about the life of a former fighter pilot, James M. Houston, Jr., mostly at bedtime when he was drowsy. Bruce said, um, what happened to your plane? He said, it crashed on fire. And Bruce said, why did your airplane crash? And he said, he got shot. And Bruce said, well, who shot your plane? And I'll never forget the look on his face. He went, the Japanese. So what do you believe now about your son James? I believe that he had a past life. I believe that his, in his past life he was James M. Houston, Jr. Uh, and he came back because he wasn't finished with something. And that's essentially what I believe. And he's not the only one. This is Ann Barron, the sister of pilot James Houston. She has met the Leiningers and can come up with only one plausible explanation for James's past life memories. The child was so convincing and coming up with all these things that there's no way in the world he could know unless there is a spiritual thing. Today, James is eight years old and finally free from the painful memories of James Houston Jr.'s death. The nightmares have stopped, but his love of airplanes continues to grow. So, uh, Jim Tucker at the University of Virginia has, has looked into this case. It's one of a few cases in the United States that seems to hold up. And I think they, they've recently come out with a book on this as well. Mental mediumship. Just very quickly then, uh, Eileen Garrett is a, a better known medium uh, in the 1950s, mostly in the United States. And she started a foundation called the Parapsychology Foundation in New York, which is still there. The classic mental mediumship involves clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, clair blank, fill in the blank. There are cases of drop-ins where uh, a medium is reading for a client and somebody else shows up out of the blue. That someone drops in with information that, that uh, turns out to be useful in some way. The cross correspondence is, I don't know how much I should go into that because it's kind of, okay, so I'll let Julie talk about that. Uh, are you going to talk about proxies? Proxies, okay. Uh, are you talk about this case, the chess case? Okay. So cross correspondence is very quickly or simply this idea that um, Two or more mediums produce bits of information that, when combined, make sense, but they don't make sense by themselves. And the messages are indirect. There's some very interesting historical cases like this. This is a case that was published a couple of years ago of a medium who channeled this uh, dead grandmaster chess player, Geza Marcosi, um, who, and, the, and he wanted, apparently, to play a living Grandmaster, Victor Korchnoi. So over a period of, of something like 10 or 20 years, uh, doing the equivalent of playing by mail, that you, you, you know, you play a, a, a movement and then wait a while to get the response and so on. This went around and around and around. Uh, eventually, Marcosi lost, but he lost in such a way that um, Kor Korchnoi knew that he was playing a world-class player. And this is interesting because and a lot of times the information that a medium might produce is relatively mundane. It doesn't require special skill. In this case, it requires a very refined and very special skill because at the grandmaster level, there's only a handful, handful of people in the world who play at that level. And they know the game so well that they can tell that the person they are playing against is about the same level. So there's a lot of chess theory. There's a lot known about the games. They're all recorded. So a colleague of mine went back to this case, which was published in 2006, and a few years ago republished or did a, another analysis, because he's a, a chess master himself, to go back and see whether the case could have been fraudulent. And the medium claimed that he did not know anything about chess, 
So he was simply acting literally as a medium between the, the dead grand, grandmaster and the living one. So he couldn't have he couldn't have faked it because he didn't know the game. By the end of the, the, the series, he understood a little bit more about the game, but certainly not playing at a, a grandmaster level. So my colleague went back and used chess computers, which now are good enough to be able to simulate play for different people. Each grandmaster has a different style of play. So he simulated the style of Mercosi playing to see whether or not it was consistent with what the actual play was, and it turns out that it is. It also turns out that the level of play was consistent with someone which is at the master or grandmaster level. So it's one of the few cases involving mental mediumship where special skills were involved which don't appear to have been possible to be fraud because, among other things, this was done back before there were any chess computers at all. So the only other possibility for fraud is that there was a living grandmaster who was giving information to the medium. There's no evidence that that occurred. In fact, there's not even evidence today that grandmasters will go back and, and try to, to, to do this kind of a game because it's at a level beyond what most people can do. So who won? Korchnoi won. But Korchnoi is recognized in, in terms of ranking of ability as being better than him, even though they lived at different times. He died in the 1930s. Uh, he's still alive. But the, these International Chess Federation rank overall levels, and he's ranked higher than him, so he probably would have won. But he won against somebody he knew who was a really good player. But what's even more interesting is you said the initiation of wanting to play was initiated by the dead one. Yeah, it was a drop-in. So he dropped in and apparently had a need to play. But I mean, so the dead person contacted the medium and said, listen, I want to play a chess game. Can you get it organized and lined up for me? Yeah. I mean, what... Oh, and the other thing, the other thing interesting about this is that presumably the dead uh, chess player did not have a board. He didn't have pieces. He didn't, you know, I'm talking about he as a real thing. There's, there's nothing there. So it's a pure, what's being played is unknown. So it either means that there actually was a dead person, a real dead grandmaster who was playing somehow, and at that level they don't actually need a board. You know, they, they can blindfold play 50 people at once and beat them all. And that's the level we're talking about. Uh, why he would feel a need to play, we need to ask him, I guess. So here's my summary. So the overall assessment is, from a, uh, a conventional point of view, claims of any kind of supernatural power completely refuted by experiment and confirmed by experiment, nothing. This is a mainstream science view of everything I just talked about. But I think it's, it's quite clear that when you actually spend the time to look at the data, that that is absolutely not true. This is, it's only true from people who don't actually bother to look at the data. And when you're, when you're presented with something which is uncomfortable, it's very easy to ignore the data. That's why most skeptics out there actually don't understand any of this stuff. They're, they're taking what they believe to be true as opposed to what the data says. Survival versus super psi, I would say that the, the jury is still out, but there's a number, there's inklings of data which suggests that super psi may, may not be the right explanation here. Because sometimes, like the chess game, it would require that the medium had the ability to play chess way beyond the ability, their own inherent ability. And if, if through Psy you can gain that level of exceptional skill, that would be amazing. That's almost more amazing than Super Psy. The question of what it is that survives, I think, is completely unresolved. Will you talk about what... Oh, oh, good. Okay. Julie will say why it doesn't matter what survives. And then there's the end of it. So now I'll hand it off to Julie, or should we take a short break? We'll take a 10 minute break. What I'm going to do is just talk till one, and then wherever I am, we'll just stop. And then I'll just pick it back up at 2.30. We'll have lunch from one to 2.30. Um, so hello, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Julie Beichel, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about my background. Um, my PhD, I got here in Tucson at the University of Arizona in pharmacology and toxicology with a minor in microbiology and immunology. So you can see how that leads directly into survival of consciousness research. <laughs> Um, actually, the short answer to the question, how did I get into this, is um, when I was in graduate school, my mom passed away. And I started to wonder what science had to say um, 
about the afterlife. And through a bunch of strange coincidences, there happened to be a postdoctoral fellowship that opened up at the University of Arizona here. Um, and so I took that position in Gary Schwartz's lab uh, when I graduated, and I worked there in that postdoc position for four and a half years. And then at the December um, 2007, the funding for that position ran out. It was funded by one kind gentleman the whole four and a half years. And um, at the end of that time, he said, I don't have any more money. Um, and so the program in um, Dr. Schwartz's lab closed and um, my husband, Mark Bacuzzi, and I started the Winbridge Institute in order to keep doing this important research because, as Dean said, there aren't very many people in the world doing this type of research. And we thought it was really important, so we started Winbridge um, to keep doing it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say. Oh, I just have some housekeeping things. Um, I get dry mouth, so I have included some comic strips in here, so I, like Dean did, so I remember to take a drink. Um, and the other thing is I have to tell whenever I speak, I have to say this. Um, I have multiple sclerosis, so I have to pee every 10 minutes. If you didn't already notice me getting up 100 times, I apologize. So if I have to stop, I apologize. Um, but I hope not to have to do that. I think I'm just going to, so I don't have too many things in my hand. Okay, um, so uh, this is our mission at the Winbridge Institute. We investigate the capabilities of our bodies, minds, and spirits and determine how that information can best serve all living things. At this time, we're only a year and a half old, so our major focus is the survival of consciousness. We're also interested in some other things. You should have a pamphlet in the bag that you got um, at your registration. If you'd like some more, we have some more. Um, but right now we're, we're mainly focusing on survival of consciousness. So we, we look at that in three different ways. We study mediums um, and information they report and their experiences during the, the communication. We also um, investigate claims of um, apparitions and hauntings. And that's actually Mark's um, forte. He uh, investigated over, I think, 500, 400 cases over 10 years when he used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So um, today I'll just be talking about mediumship, but if you have any questions <laughs> later, we can talk to Mark about ghosts. Um, and then the third arm of our survival research is um, using technology to detect and or communicate with or um, interact with the deceased. So how can technology be used in that capacity? Okay, so um, without fail, you have seen at least some of these um, references to ghosts and, and or mediums in the popular culture. But in fact, the study of mediumship is well over 100 years old. As Dean said, it was um, the impetus for the start of parapsychology as a science and the beginning of the societies for psychical research here in America and in Europe. Um, if you're interested in that early time of mediumship research, I highly recommend this book, Ghost Hunters by Deborah Bloom. It's, it's just a really nice, it's a good read, and it's some really interesting things. So after 100 years um, of mediumship research, we can confidently say that, the, um, that there is such a thing as what we call anomalous information reception, or AIR. So that is, AIR is the phenomenon that um, certain mediums can report accurate and specific information about the deceased um, without any prior knowledge about the deceased, who we call a discarnate. Um, dis means not, and carn means flesh, so not in the flesh. So without any information, previous information about the deceased, the discarnate, or the living person who wants to talk to the discarnate, we call that person the sitter, so they can report information without any prior information about the sitter or the discarnate, without using fraud or deception, and without any feedback during the reading. So we can say they're reporting this information, and it, from where it comes is anomalous. So um, why should we research mediumship today if we've been doing it for 100 years? Well, the medium's processes are much different today. The historical research often included um, trance mediums who went into trance during the reading, and they took on the, the they allowed the discarnate to take possession of their body and use their voice and whatnot to, to get the message across. And they didn't have any conscious 
experience of the reading as it took place. They were unconscious, and the dead person spoke through them. And um, the mediums we work with, and I think you could say um, the majority of mediums in the world today are mental mediums, not trance mediums. So they remain awake and aware. We're also able to use more sophisticated and rigorous methods today than 100 years ago. And the results of mediumship research have important scientific and social implications. I'm going to do this. Or not. Thank you. Um, and so some of these uh, important scientific and social implications are this question we've been talking about all morning, that the relationship between the mind and consciousness and the brain, um, does mind live in the brain, or is it, does the brain just serve as a receiver for mind? Um, mediums might be able to perform socially useful tasks like um, finding missing persons and solving crimes, but we need to understand um, what they do and how they do it better before we can use that um, ubiquitously in society. The dead might have wisdom that we don't have access to um, that can help us solve problems in the world today. The, um, the results of scientific evidence for life after death may be helpful in hospice. So, you know, some people, um, when faced at the end with their own mortality, are comfort, comforted by um, religion, but I'm going to be comforted by science. And I assume that there are other people in the world like that. Um, and so this this um, idea that science can say something about whether or not there's life after death um, may help people uh, during their transition and as well as their families. It, the evidence for life after death may have a huge impact on allopathic health care. Um, right now, I think it's safe to say physicians view death as a failure that something has gone wrong, whereas um, it's, it's only natural. I, uh, I spoke at um, a hospice in San Diego recently, and I heard um, one of the, the grief counselors said the phrase that she uses is, none of us make it out of here alive. Um, so it's, some, it's, a, it's an inevitable fact that we need to, um, to take into account, and I'm, I'm continually appalled by the fact that we train the hell out of our mothers on what birth is going to be like and how to give birth so everybody's happy and comfortable, but we don't have that same training um, for dying. And I heard a story recently about um, someone was in hospice and um, he had trained uh, in the, in, uh, he, he was Buddhist and he had trained in this, in the way that Buddhists view the death process and um, the, the nurses kept coming in and turning the TV on in his room. And he kept turning it off like, I just need to meditate. And they couldn't foresee, like, why he would want to be alone with his thoughts when he was dying, that he clearly would want to, you know, watch Survivor or whatever. Um, no pun intended. Um, so th we can make that a lot easier for people who are dying, and I think that would make it easier for the people that they were, the people they loved they were leaving behind, too. Um, and the big one is mediumship readings may be helpful in grief counseling, and I'll talk at length about that a little later. So uh, how do we bring mediums into the lab? Um, colored liquid in a test tube is the international symbol for in the lab. Um, Though I worked in a lot of labs and I've never seen green or blue liquid in a lab. Um, but so how do we bring mediums into the lab? I, you know, I joke, how do we get them out from behind their crystal ball and into the lab? But um, the truth is no one that we work with uses a crystal ball. They're very, um, you know, they're everyday average people. And if you saw them in the grocery store, you would never know that they were mediums. Um, they're just regular people who happen to be able to to communicate efficiently with the dead. So, and we'll hear, Dave is there in the picture. Um, so we'll hear from Dave a little bit later today. So we study um, mediums through three methods at Winbridge, proof-focused, research process-focused research, and applied research. And I'll go through each of those. 